Welcome. In, in this talk, we are going to be focusing on how OWASP Cyclone DX thinks about the cloud. Now, in Cyclone DX, when we think about the cloud, we think of, of three different buckets of things. The first bucket on the left are services as inventory in a traditional software bill of material. Um, this has been supported in Cyclone DX for many years already since version 1.2. And we think that services are an integral part of your inventory and dependency graph. They're especially important to be there. Um, unlike software components, services by definition increase the attack surface of your application. So not including them is um, not exactly something that the OWASP community would, would recommend. So services just as a, an integral part of your inventory of your software bill of materials is, is, is one thing that we, we see uh, for, for cloud. Now, if we were to strip away all of your software components so that you're left with only services and the dependency relationships between other services, well, that's really what a SaaS bomb is, or software as a service bill of material. And this also has been supported in Cyclone DX for many years, since version 1.2. The third bucket is really low-code application platforms, right? These are code, uh, sometimes code, uh, many times it's just configuration with a little bit of optional code, and voila, you have an application. Uh, so that's another area where we see the cloud. Now, for those that might need a refresher or for those that maybe are unaware, this is the high-level object model within Cyclone DX. Uh, fairly simple and straightforward. Obviously, this is high-level. It, it, it goes into the weeds and in each one of these things, so we can get a lot more granular. But at the very top in the purple, we see metadata. And this is really information about the bill of material or about the component that the bill of material describes. Um, what are the tools that used to create the bill of material or validate the bill of material? Who created it? What, what is the component this bill of material describes, et cetera? <clears throat> In the blue, this is really the inventory of the software and hardware uh, that your bill of material describes. Yes, Cyclone DX does support hardware as a first class citizen. Uh, we actually have multiple um, examples for, for HBOM if, if anyone is interested. But we also, in green, we, we also provide inventory of services. And we can describe things like the provider of those services and the endpoints and the data classifications and directional flow of data and all kinds of other things about those services as well. And then we can describe the dependency relationships. What components depend on other components? Do those components depend on services? Do those services depend on other services? Right. So the complete, the complete dependency graph of both components and services can be represented. And then we move into how complete is the inventory of your components? How complete is the inventory of your services? And how complete is the inventory of your dependency relationships between these things? And you can describe all of those today. Um, we support bill of vulnerability use cases as well. So if you want to trade vulnerability information between two different systems, perfectly valid use case. Um, you can also describe these are the vulnerabilities that affect a particular product or service. Um, you can also describe things like VEX, which is the vulnerability exploitability exchange, which is a way to analyze, say, hey, this component may have this vulnerability, but it's not actually impacted by this vulnerability. And finally, there's a lot of different ways to extend Cyclone DX to get it to do all kinds of different things that maybe it doesn't come with out of the box, but do so in a completely supportable way. So when we look at that first box on the left, this is really about services being represented as inventory in a software bill of material. And on this sample application, this example application, it looks like I have six different components that I my application depends on. 
one of these components is interesting. It's Acme Stock Library version 1.6. And that library, it looks like, relies on um, an external service called Acme Stock Service. Looking at this, it looks like it might stock, uh, fetch stock quotes from the, from the internet because it, it tells me that I'm passing um, secret, uh, some kind of secret, pr probably a credential of some kind, uh, along with public information, uh, quite possibly the stock ticker, to that service. And in response, I'm getting PiFi or personally identifiable financial information in return. And you can describe this relationship and all the data classifications and directional flow of data and trust boundary traverses and all this information in Cyclone DX today. Now, in doing so, your services just become part of the inventory and dependency graph of your software bill of material. In many cases, um, the completeness that you might want to describe might actually exclude first-party first party services. For example, some of your internal services that you as a vendor might rely on might actually be confidential, right? It might be proprietary. You, you may not want to disclose those out. You might only want to disclose these are the external services that we rely on. And you can describe those what those services are. And you can say that the completeness, that it's third party only. So that when somebody looks at your SBOM and sees that you're including external services and you can mark it as though that this is just an inventory of your third party services that you depend on. Completely valid use case. And as cloud vendors, right, just know that the services we provide could be used as inventory in other vendors' SBOMs, right? That's perfectly acceptable and expected use case. Now, if we were to strip away all of the software components so that we're left with nothing but services and their dependency relationships to other services, well, that's really what a SaaS bomb is all about. Now, we are not trying to reinvent things like infrastructure as code. That's, that's not what this is intended to, to do. So things like Terraform or CloudFormation, we are not trying to um, replicate that functionality, right? Things like AWS security groups. Well, I can't consume an AWS security group, but I can consume an S3 bucket. An S3 bucket would be a really good thing that, I might want to add in my SAS bomb. But we don't pre prescribe any kind of architecture, which means that support for services is architectural agnostic. So you can describe microservices. You can describe lambdas and functions. You can describe the actor model if you're running the Beam VM. You can describe really complex system of systems. For example, an automobile with all of its different systems and how they all communicate with one another can be described using services with Cyclone DX. Here's a very simple um, diagram of a pretty basic microservice architecture. I've got, I'm going to concentrate on the services in blue. These are the services that maybe my development team, my organization, these are the things that we deliver to market, right? These are the services that, uh, that we support. And my SAS bomb can describe all five of these services, for example, and their relationships to other services. For example, microservice two right in the middle there has a dependency on service four and service five. And then it looks like microservice one connects to a, 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 a Postgres SQL database and, and service three connects to uh, a, an S3 bucket on AWS. And you can describe with a single SAS bomb, you can describe this kind of environment. And you can link out to its corresponding S bomb, such that if you want to describe, for example, your inventory of all your components that rep that were uh, uh, used to create microservice two, for example, well, you can link out to the S bomb that that actually does that. So 
you basically have an entire graph of, of starting with the SAS bomb and you can go down to the individual S bombs if you, if you so choose. There's a lot of different use cases for including services in a bill of material. And number one, and probably the most obvious is inventory, right? Just knowing what services you have or have a dependency on is, you know, beneficial for a lot of different reasons, uh, not just security. Um, but what, once you know what you have, you can start identifying what the attack surface is uh, of your respective application. And in some cases, you can actually work to reduce that. For example, if I have a service and that service depends on some external services, well, that's interesting, but I might not want to take that risk. Maybe I want to choose a different provider that has a very similar service that doesn't have those external dependencies. So I can start identifying what these things are and start reducing my attack surface. You can use this for anomaly detection in a couple of different ways. For example, that SAS bomb had five services. Well, what if I, what, what if I observe a sixth service just magically appearing? Well, is that because an adversary uh, got into my environment? Or was it the responsibility of a development team? Maybe they didn't follow a process to update the SAS bomb. Um, either way, it's, it's really good for me to be able to identify that and then investigate that. But with the SAS bomb, you, you're, you're documenting the expected data flows and data classification. So if a service is now suddenly talking to another service that I didn't expect it to, or if it's now passing a different data classification to a service, well, that's that's interesting. Uh, it might have to revisit my compliance controls just to make sure that um, you know my service can accept this new kind of data classification. Um, in the event of an incident, and there inevitably will one uh, be one, no matter what environment you're in. But being able to investigate what that blast radius is, for example. Where does all my personally identifiable information go? Because I might have to track that for, you know, uh, information leakage of, you know, email addresses and and um, phone numbers and that sort of thing, and send that to my customers. Well, being able to know what services might be impacted by that is really good in the in the event of an incident. And obviously, there's a number of different security and, and privacy compliance use cases that that you can achieve with services in the context of a bill of material. And finally, that bucket on that box on the, on the far right, platform applications. And specifically, low-code application platforms. This is a, a really high growth area in enterprise IT today, where low-code apps can usually consist of configuration, optionally a little bit of code, and voila, you have, a, you have an application and you can deploy that application. You can even put them in different stores that exist for different ecosystems. And in some cases, not all, but in some cases, you can even include third-party libraries in that optional code for that low-code app. There's a number of, of different um, research things ongoing with low-code application platforms today. So if you're interested in this, I, I highly encourage you to check out the OWASP Top 10 Low-Code, No-Code project. Um, like the OWASP Top 10, this project focuses on low-code or no-code apps, um, the top 10 most um, prevalent risk for these types of applications. Full support for low-code application platforms is planned for Cyclone DX version 1.5. If you'd like to get involved with the Cyclone DX community, uh, the website is a really great place to start. Uh, we also have a secondary site on, uh, on oas.org slash Cyclone DX. Our GitHub organization, if you, if you want to start contributing, if you want to start using, reading the docs, there's a lot of great information in our GitHub organization. Slack is where all a lot of the users are hanging out, all the maintainers are hanging out, and of course, the Cyclone DX core team is also hanging out. Lots of great conversations happening in Slack. 
uh, invite if for those who, who may not necessarily be on it today. And for those without access to Slack for one reason or another, we do maintain a mailing list. It's fairly, it's not overly used that much, but it is a backup method of communication for those that, uh, that do not have access to Slack. So with that, thank you so much. Hopefully this was uh, enlightening in terms of how Cyclone DX thinks about the cloud. Thank you so much.